wherever it is you're joining us from. And again, this is the First Lady Lou Hoover program, and I'm joined tonight by my friend Andrew Oak, who I always enjoy listening to speak because he's super knowledgeable, very passionate, very friendly, uh, just all around great guy. So really looking forward to that. Hold on, I have to finish setting up a couple things. Just let's go over a few housekeeping items before we officially begin. So for those of you who have not done so already, we always welcome people to introduce themselves. If you wanna tell us your first name, where you're connecting from and your favorite first lady, it's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from. Robert, at this point, I throw in a quick little hello to my friend Margie in Bethany Beach, Delaware. Uh, I know that she's got a group of ladies assembled with some hors d'oeuvres and some a nice spread there for a Friday. Oh, awesome. It's wonderful to have them here tonight, and I just wanted to say hello. Oh, yeah. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. and appreciate you. Hope that you're having good weather in Bethany Beach. And then we don't do a Zoom demonstration during these programs, but just real quick, there's usually only a couple things that people want to know how to do. One is to adjust the sound. So everyone will be in listen only mode except for Andrew and myself. So we have done sound tests and everything seems to be working fine. If you want to adjust the sound on your session, either up or down, you can check the settings locally on your own device. Um, if you want to adjust the screen display so that the slides that we're going to be showing take up the full screen. If that's not currently happening in Zoom on your device, look for something called either view or view options. And there's something called side by side mode that that you can check off. There you go. There's the screen for that. Thanks for the heads up on that. Um, let's see. And so for those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And I kind of sort of more of the MC tonight than the host. Uh, Andrew's the actual expert on Lou Hoover. And this is actually our fourth program we've done. We've done almost one every month. So Andrew spoke initially uh, just kind of about the first ladies in general uh, was our first presentation. It was really fascinating to get his perspective on them. And then we followed that up with, we had a special program just on Abigail Adams. That was the second program. And the third one was we did Lucy Hayes. And then tonight is, oh, before we get into tonight. So all those other three programs are recorded and they're on our YouTube page. You can find them on Washington DC History and Culture. I can email out the links when we're done, or I can also put them, I'll put them in the chat um, in Zoom and whatnot so you can pull those up um, but tonight we're going to be talking about Lou Hoover and I really like these programs that Andrew's been doing because it's very knowledgeable it really gives a lot of insight um, into the first ladies as people what were they really like um, as individuals how were they kind of similar or different to other people of their era uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so Andrew always does a great job so with that I'm going to turn things over to him. So Andrew, take it away. It's all yours. And throughout our program, if you have any questions or comments, type them in the chat or the Q&A or the comments, and we'll um, send those off to Andrew once he's finished, though. We'll wait till he's all done. And you are seeing my screen, Robert? I can. It came up perfectly. Okay, wonderful. And welcome, everybody. Robert, thank you for that great introduction. It's fantastic to be here with everyone. I appreciate you spending some of your, uh, some of your Friday evening, some of your Friday night, whatever you're doing. And um, it's going to be fun. This is a different kind of history speech. I'm not a traditional historian. I'm, I didn't go to school to be a historian. I didn't go to school to be an author, although I've always written and done a lot of writing in my career as a television producer. And that's how I come to you as the first ladies man. But it's really these ladies that made me the first ladies man. These ladies made me a historian. I was uh, had the good fortune of being in the right place at the right time when a friend of mine at C-SPAN needed a series producer for their White House Historical Association and C-SPAN series, First Ladies Influence and Image. It aired from President's Day 2013 to President's Day 2014. It's available at firstladiesman.com on the video page. You can go right there and it links you right to the C-SPAN page. You can also buy my books. Would love to sign some books for you and get the full story on all of these women for all of my travels. These books currently go from Martha Washington all the way up to and through when uh, Melania Trump became uh, uh, the first lady. 
And uh, I'm now studying Dr. Jill Biden and seeing what she's going to do with the role. And these volumes will expand and I continue my travels and continue telling these stories of these incredible women that revealed themselves to me to have all been a major influence, all been uh, a, an influence on our modern world in ways that we didn't know. And, um, and, and an influence on their husband's administrations in ways that we didn't know, because we typically are not taught this. And even when you go to these locations that I went to, every library, church, school, cemetery, birthplace, train station, general store, um, for every first lady, Martha Washington, the series covered up through Michelle Obama. And then, as I mentioned, I continue on through Melania Trump in these books and Dr. Jill Biden now. Um, but, but again, like these first ladies are not formally trained. There's no first ladies 101 in college. Um, there's no job description to first lady. They don't even have to assume the duties of first ladies. And many women did not, uh, primarily in the, in, the, in the 18, more in the 1800s um, than, than, than we know in the 1900s and 2000s. But uh, many first ladies were either by age or, or, or uh, 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 did not desire the role or, or um, uh, health kept many women out of this. Um, not again in modern times, the, the last time where a non-wife, a, a woman not married to the president was handled the first lady duties was when Woodrow Wilson's first wife, Ellen died uh, in the White House. And then his eldest daughter, Margaret took over the duties until he got married again to um, uh, Edith Wilson. Uh, that's a whole nother story. We'll do the Wilson women for sure. There's a, they're too, too important not to, both of them actually. Um, but uh, a, a slight review for, for, um, for some who have heard me before, but if you're new to me and this group and understand, um, America wouldn't be America without Martha Washington. That's about as plainly as I put it. And I give this historical reference and precedent because again, these women are not widely studied, uh, you know, all of them. Um, the Lou Hoover, the one we're gonna talk to about tonight was not a first lady that I knew very well. Wasn't the first lady that I would even name if I were naming five, 10, 15, 20 first ladies. Um, sort of a hidden administration uh, shadowed by the Great Depression and a single term, but um, two of the most accomplished uh, people to ever live in the White House as president and first lady. But, but getting back to George and Martha Washington, um, Martha Washington was left a widow at 26, and her first husband left her extremely well off with 8,000 acres of tobacco land, four to five times the Virginia state governor's annual salary, cash in hand, silver, uh, a lot of real estate in Williamsburg. She's essentially one of the first successful female CEOs of the colonies. And if she could not manage this, 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 this corporation, basically, all of this wealth, all of this real estate, all of this, this, uh, uh, all of these finances, George Washington would have had to do this when they married. And, and if George Washington had to do that, he could not go out and, and general and command this revolution. And, and, and to think that Martha was on board with this, that Martha also went to all of the winter encampments of the Revolutionary War to help politic, to help entertain, to help bring foreign dignitaries that were paying for the revolution other military leaders together. I mean, they couldn't all talk on the phone. They had to come together during these winter encampments to really plan this, this, this revolution against one of the most powerful forces in the world at the time. Um, this is a highly uh, capable, a highly intelligent, and a necessary woman in the story and the formation of the United States of America. And without the United States of America, the modern world looks very differently. That's a very quick overview because I do want to get to Lou Hoover and talk about her, but that's how important these women have been from the beginning, again, in a role that is not elected, not paid, not defined, and each woman is left to make it her own, and she does, and leaves this, this mark, even if we don't know about it uh, uh, currently, they've all left a mark on the White House, on the United States, and thus the world around us, the modern world that we enjoy today. So let's get to Lou Hoover. Let's talk about why Lou Hoover. When I am asked always from the very, very beginning, who's your favorite first lady? We asked you that tonight when you're logging on, who's your favorite first lady and why? Well, people ask me and that's an impossible question for me to answer. And I don't, I, I, I qualify it always. And I say, if I have to pick one, if it's life or death, if I'm on a desert island and it means the difference between me eating or not eating or living or, or, or not surviving on this island, if I had to pick one, it would be Lou Hoover. 
Lou Hoover is one of my all time favorite first ladies for a number of reasons. Lou Hoover revealed herself to me to be, again, as I mentioned, one of the most capable, one of the most remarkable women to ever hold the title of first lady and her and Herbert Hoover, two of the most capable and incredible human beings to ever live in the White House. Now this also, during my travels, during my journey, was the furthest west that I'd gotten. I hadn't gotten out of, out of uh, uh, St. Louis or, or Ohio. My gosh, I spent so much time in Ohio driving around from one end to the other. And then in season two, I spent a lot of time driving through Texas, as you would imagine, for three different first ladies there. But Lou gave me a chance to get west of the Mississippi, to really expand my, my map and, and my reach and go to the birthplace of Herbert Hoover. Now, this is also the Hoover Museum and Library in West Branch is the first of all of the libraries, the presidential libraries um, and museums to be run by the National Archives and Records Administration. Lou Hoover is also the last first lady that let me travel to multiple places uh, that, the, that the series had time to allow for. And as these presidential museums and libraries get more established um, uh, as, as, as the administrations get more modern and these libraries become new, um, there's, there's more resources there and they put everything more under one roof. And Lou was still a little bit spread out. And I'm gonna tell you about each of the locations and what they meant to me. But now here's where Lou gets very, very special to me. Um, jump ahead one slide. This is the L Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum in West Branch. This is where I gave my first speech as the first ladies man. Um, it, it's it's the, thank you to everyone in West Branch who had the faith in me and the desire who I met and taught me so much as everyone did at each location, but they were the first one to give me a speech. It was right around Mother's Day weekend of 2014 after the, um, after the series had ended, and I'd never done this before. I'd done some public speaking and, and had a radio show, and, and I'm a television producer, so multimedia was not, um, you know, lost on me or anything, but, th but this, was, this was the first time so speaking in front of a, an audience of this size and certainly speaking as an expert on any subject. So, you know, Lou will always have a special place in my life. Now, I should also mention, this is where I learned about Lou as a little girl. This is where I learned about Lou as a young woman. This is where I learned about the Hoovers as a couple. And there was so much information and so many things there that it really, it just expanded my knowledge of a woman again, that I did not know the name of her off the tip of my tongue when I first started this, like, who's Herbert Hoover's wife? Well, you know, you don't think about that, but there's a lot in a name. Now I want to jump back. I want you to notice this slide. This is her diploma from Stanford University. We'll get to uh, Stanford a little bit later because my travels did take me out there. But Lou Henry was, uh, Henry is her maiden name. She was born in Waterloo, Iowa. And Herbert Hoover was born in West Branch, Iowa. Now, one role that these first ladies often take on, if not always, is helping to protect the legacy of their husbands and represent the administration in a historical sense. And it's Lou Hoover who's responsible for purchasing the boyhood home of Herbert Hoover, of which is on the grounds of the Hoover Library, which becomes the first library in the National Archives and Records Administration. So she has the first real indelible footprint that, 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 that government involvement, preserving something, understanding the necessity to put these. I can't, it's really surprising that it took us to Hoover to get to the point where we would secure this type of history with federal tax dollars and administrations and, and regulating it to the point where we knew that it would always be preserved, not moved, not destroyed, not sold off in private collections or auctions. But I want you to notice here that her name on the diploma is Lou, not Louise. You all know, or most of you should know, the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. This is a girl named Lou. Lou's father wanted a son desperately, and he got a daughter. So he named her Lou. And then also because of some poor health with Lou's mother, Lou's father was the one who would move the family out to California and take Lou on these adventures that would shape her as this woman that would really go on to, 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 to do remarkable and incredible things that we will discuss. So Lou Hoover starts off her life as a youngster in California. And it's strange because Lou Hoover, Lou Henry, and Herbert Hoover, both born in Iowa, both end up in California. Now, Herbert Hoover is our second orphaned president. 
He bounced, uh, Andrew Jackson is the first, and Herbert Hoover bounced around from family home to family home to family home. He was obviously a smart kid, had some aspirations, and ended up with an uncle, I believe, in California, and he was going there so he could get free college education, established residency, which I believe is still the case today. Lou Hoover, born in Waterloo, Iowa, ends up there because her father was doing some fortune seeking. He was a banker, wanted to get into finances and moved out to San Francisco, but also this adventurer that would go out into the wilderness and into the desert and camp. And he taught Lou to shoot rifles and bows and arrows and hunt and camp and, and, and look at flowers and, and boating and, and all of the outdoor activities that he wanted to teach this son that he then got Lou, and again, a girl named Lou, um, not short for Louise, and you can see it right there on her college diploma. I've held that college diploma in Stanford. So Lou Hoover goes on to go to Stanford where Herbert Hoover goes to college, and they meet in geology class, and Lou Hoover was the first woman in America to graduate with a geology degree. And this would open up an entire world and an entire career and self-made wealth for the, Hooter, the Hoovers that would play a role in their lives from beginning to end. I'll get into more detail in that a bit. But to think that these two folks who did not know each other from separate parts of uh, um, Iowa end up in California together, end up at Stanford together, end up in geology class together, fall in love, Hoover goes off and he's mining gold in, in, in Australia at the time and proposes to Lou in a telegram. And Lou says, okay. So Herbert Hoover comes back by steamship. They get married in San Francisco. They have a two day honeymoon at a resort there and they hop on the steamer and go back to Australia. And this starts their precious gems, minerals, uh, uh, their career in, in geology and mining um, that would again, take them around the world numerous times before they would get into the White House and produce a self-made wealth that allowed them to be the first administration in modern times, the first administration since the Washingtons to not take a salary to volunteer not to take a salary. They did not want money for this role. They did not want money for this position. And Lou was a big part of that decision. Now, after that, Washington did not get paid to be president, George Washington. The Hoovers are the first to decline a salary. The Kennedys are the second. And then the Trumps recently also declined that salary. But an interesting little tidbit there. Um, there's West Branch again, jumping forward. Something the, 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 that is interesting, before my first speech, I just wanted to mention that, that it's very interesting to me, and it's very, it's a special moment for me before I speak at a museum. And when I went there to, to learn about each of these uh, uh, first ladies, is to stop by and see their final resting place and to almost just have a private, quiet conversation in my head to thank them for sharing so much because especially as you go further and further back. I think in modern times, we all know that their lives become an open book during the campaign season, unfortunately, in, in some capacities. Um, but we know so much more about them. But the fact that they do take this role of public service, they are, I think, at least intending in, 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 in each and every case to do the right thing, more so even in the case of the First Lady, and to, to, to be able to read these letters and share these things. And I'm going to share some very intimate, special things about Lou Hoover here in, in a moment. But Lou and Ho Herbert Hoover, as I mentioned, traveled around the world. They developed this great wealth. And they were so capable and so uh, accomplished before they got into the White House, um, it, 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 you wonder where this comes from. And you want to know what type of girl Lou was. And I mentioned that she was uh, taken by her father. That is a young teenage Lou Hoover with rifle in hand on a burrow about to go out with her father into the wilderness of California again. Lou kept journals, endless journals, uh, where she would go camping. She would draw pictures of her campsites. She would identify flowers. She would identify animals. She would write about her adventures with her father that she would have. Like I say, raised primarily by her father. Her mother was not in poor health. And Lou had one younger sister eight years younger. And I think that younger sister stayed behind quite a bit as Lou would go out into these adventures. She developed this love of the outdoors, this love of this Annie Oakley lifestyle, um, developed these hobbies, learned how to shoot, learned how to fish, learned how to cook over a campfire, archery, all the things that I mentioned that she gravitated to, which then turned into this love of geology when she gets to 
uh, Stanford and meets Herbert Hoover. But on one of her journals that she wrote for a, a composition for school is dated January 20th of 1890. 1890. This would be years, decades before women could vote, before women were, were I guess in the mid 1800s, we were starting to see women get uh, formal educations and go to college and things like this. But, but, but Lou, again, the, the first woman to graduate with a geology degree. And if you saw, there's, I, I couldn't find any, I know that they're out there and, and we, you can search on Google for this. And I, they definitely have them at the museum. The, the uniform that Lou would have to wear to go out into the field was a, you know, neck to ankle flannel, uh, thick dress where he's just, I mean, like I was sweating, looking at the picture, thinking about her go out to study these rocks and learn about geology with her little pick. And they have all of her kit there at Stanford University that she would use to learn about these rocks and gems and stones and everything out in her field work for her college degree. And to think about it, I mean, you, you almost get the, 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 the vision of a, of a, of a civil war soldier in just this thick wool heavy protecting again like neck to ankle that again it made me sweat to look at it but back to this uh, essay that she wrote january 20th of 1890 and it is titled independent girl this is a this is an unusual brain this is an unusual process of thought this is an unusual woman this is a woman who is already writing about stepping outside of traditional roles that we still struggle with today, that we still see uh, uh, some women, some young girls held back, told they can't do things. Um, you know, the, these, these, these women, they were so accomplished, all of them. So they would, they would kind of, out of necessity, because of what society held from them or kept from them, would have to hitch these wagons, their wagons, to these men if they were going to get these ideas out. And a lot of them, like I mentioned, Martha Washington, George Washington married up. You, we can say it, most of the founding fathers did. And I think it's because these women had these ideas, they had these independent thoughts, they had these aspirations, this natural intelligence and aptitude that they found these rising star men. They found this man, Lou found this man in geology class at Stanford that would be this self-made millionaire. And a lot of them couldn't predict that these careers would take them to the White House. And, and, and especially early on, I mean, my gosh, for Martha Washington and the beginning of the 1700s and early 1800s, there was no definition of this role even remotely beyond the fact that the role is still not defined today. There is no instructions, no A, B, and C. It's unelected, it's unpaid, yet these women do so much with it. Independent girl, January 20th, 1890. I'm going to read a small excerpt from, uh, from, her, from, her, from her journal entry, from her composition, her school composition that was written in her journal from Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 2, which is, the, which is what Lou Hoover has in it. And Lou Hoover writes, Independent Girl, January 30th of 1890. And this is, this is what she says in it. Sooner or later, she will meet a spirit equally as independent as her own. And then there is a clash of mortal combat or they unite forces with combined strength to go forth and meet the world. Lou Hoover wrote that at 16 years old. Later in college, as a young woman, she would meet Herbert Hoover. And I'm sure there was a little bit of clash as a strong personality as she did but then they did unite forces. They did get married. They did have the combined strength that went forth to meet the world all the way to the White House. It gives me goosebumps. It literally gives me goosebumps to read this of a 16 year old girl. And imagine in 1890, what Lou Hoover, Lou Henry was told that she couldn't do. Think of what she couldn't do as a grown woman. Think of what she couldn't do in the early 1900s. Think of what she still couldn't do by the time she got into the White House. Vote. But she was an independent girl in her mind in the 1890s. I, 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 I can't overstate that. As they traveled around the world as husband and wife and created this great wealth, Lou started something else that was very unusual and they have very well represented at the West Branch Library there in Iowa. She started collections. 
And collections, she, she, she had one of the largest, she ended up with one of the largest blue and white China collections, Ming Dynasty and other, other specific dynasties uh, from when she was in China. They were in China during the Boxer Rebellion. Um, uh, she actually wrote to a friend, there's a letter that they have there at the museum uh, library in, in Iowa that, says, that describes that her friend was, I guess she was invited to come and stay with them in, in, in uh, China. Uh, and probably the Boxer Rebellion and the violence and the stuff kept her from going, or who knows what kept her from going, but she didn't go. So Lou was writing to her friend and saying, you're missing all the fun. My bicycle tires got shot out in Tiananmen Square. And keep in mind, Lou had a six shooter on her holster as she was riding her bicycle through Tiananmen Square as her bicycle tires got shot out. And she just thought it was a grand time. She thought this was absolutely fantastic. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't laugh enough about it and tell her friend that she was missing all the fun, so to speak. Um, this was the type of woman Lou was throughout her entire life, this adventurer, as we hear, see her sitting there on the on the burrow. Um, uh, there's a picture, Lou, a little bit older. Uh, we'll get to that Girl Scout uniform, which plays a, a role. So about her collections, she collected she collected the blue and white china from when she was in the uh, was in Asia. Uh, she's the only first lady to speak Mandarin Chinese. She's the only first lady to speak an Asian language at all. She spoke seven languages, most of them self-taught from these travels of where she would go in the world. She also started collecting weapons. She has a weapons collection. Some of the weapons she has in her collection, you'll read in the book, they don't even know what the weapons are for. They know where they come from, but there are spears, swords, daggers, guns, hatchets, axes, probably 15, 20 some boomerangs from when she was in Australia. And, and, and the, the, the way that they're cared for and were displayed in the various homes that they would have, and it's quite extensive. It is a, it is a massively extension, extensive weapons collection. They were also in London for a considerable amount of time, right about the time of World War I, when World War I was breaking out. And they had a pewter collection. They were in they were in London mining pewter, and that was that was the the gem or mineral of the time that was working. And this is where we start to see just what capable and philanthropic thinking people these are, willing to put anyone else before themselves, willing to sacrifice any kind of wealth to help other people without any expectation of being paid back. As they were in Europe, in London beginning of World War I, they could see the handwriting on the wall. Everyone could see it. So what Lou and, and Herbert Hoover did was they started funding safe houses for American diplomats, wives and children of diplomats, uh, um, uh, expats, people that, that needed to get out. And the government couldn't move these people out as quickly as they liked. And so the Hoovers would pay for these houses to get the people closer to the ships. They would get them across the sea, across the Atlantic Ocean, back to America where it was safe before things really unfolded in, 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 uh, in Europe with World War I. I mean, America wasn't even involved in the war yet or hadn't declared war. It would have been the Wilson administration at that point. And, and this is what Lou and Herbert Hoover did because it's just, they had the money, they had the means. Why would they not? Why would they not pay for these safe houses? Why would they not pay for the transportation of these people to get back home to America where it would be safe? And then during World War I, the Hoovers, I, I, I'm not sure what really drove this desire, but they kept the Belgian lace industry alive. And I'm, I'm told, at least at one point in time, the, uh, um, in, in Belgium is where the only, the only place in the world outside of the United States for a considerable amount of time, and maybe even to this day, that has a, a, a statue of a U.S. president. And that's how much they revered uh, uh, the Hoovers uh, for, for doing what they did to keep that Belgian lace industry alive as just something else that they would they saw a need for and went in and, and did that because they had the means and, and they could do it. Just truly, truly remarkable people. Now, I should mention the Girl Scout. Because when they were in London, and Lou always said that she was a Girl Scout before she was a, before there were Girl Scouts. Um, and we could see that from the borough picture. Uh, Lou Hoover was the first first lady or former first lady, I think at the time, to become an honorary Girl Scout. She was instrumental in bringing what was uh, the, um, the English, the, the British 
uh, version of Girl Scouts to the United States. She was also part of the planning and the, uh, the, the structuring and implementation of the first Girl Scout cookie drive. So whether you love Girl Scout cookies or you hate that time of year because you know you're going to sit down and eat a whole box sitting watching TV of Thin Mints or do si are my personal favorite, you've got Lou Hoover to thank in part for those, uh, for those Girl Scout cookies. Um, she also loved technology. She's the first first lady to do uh, a, a regular radio address. Um, you know, just the, 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 the endless foresight and embracing of the world around her. Lou also had a, a, one of the first movie cameras, one of the first consumer grade movie cameras and took all these home movies that they also have at the, uh, at the Hoover Museum there in West Branch um, on steamer ships as they would go around the world and, 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 and across countries and across uh, uh, continents and, and do their work and to embrace this type of radio. And there she is in her Girl Scout uniform. Uh, it, it's just absolutely fantastic what this woman saw in the world around her and the need to share it and embrace it. Um, that combined with the philanthropy, that combined with, with the, the selflessness of giving these funds to help uh, American citizens get out of, of Europe is stuff that we would see all throughout their life. This is an interesting aspect to think about how capable these folks were, how uh, productive they were, how helpful they were, but we don't remember them for that. When we think of Hoover, typically, generally, we think of the Great Depression. Now, Hoover, the Great Depression hit, the stock market crashed three months into office, and Hoover did not have a political career. He wasn't a senator. He wasn't a congressman. He wasn't a governor. He was not involved in politics. He was not a lawmaker. So all of the things that led up to that, which, you know, it, I'm not an economist, and, and I can't get into the Great Depression or what caused it or what solved it. I know that, that economies ebb and flow, and I know that presidents and administrations inherit good economies and inherit bad economies, and things that happen in, in, in long down the road in the past and things that happen in the future can affect that economy, meaning that I don't think, in my opinion, any president or first lady or human being, to be honest with you, could cause or solve the Great Depression in four or eight years, just given what I know about economic trends, or in three months where Hoover was in there and his financial advisor or his, his treasury secretary, apparently like he resigned, as soon as it happened, he resigned. So people were, you know, like rats sinking a ship, sinking ship, they were out of there. But this teaches us that Events that happen in the world, events that the that America is involved with can overshadow the good that some of these people do while they are in office and while they are in the White House. I will do another show on Pat Nixon. Pat Nixon collected more artifacts for the White House, historical artifacts, uh, art pieces, things for the White House collection than any other first lady in history. We don't know this. We don't know about a lot of her travels, widely known because of Watergate and other things that happened. The, the, the Great Depression is kind of Hoover's Watergate. It's Hoover's scandal. It's Hoover's problem. And then this incredibly productive, capable, and giving woman is swept aside under the carpets of history because of the Great Depression. Does the Great Depression matter? Absolutely. It's great. It's massive. It is, it, it, you know, but, but, but to the point where it eclipses this woman, that's where I like to try and bring out this perspective and talk about these folks and, and inspire a curiosity. And if some of the people on this call, as soon as things open back up, go running to West Branch because they want to, I'll tell you, people that follow me on social media and have read the books and things, that would not have named Lou Hoover again, if you were naming five, 10, 15, 20 first ladies, they now, when I put up daily posts and one happens to be about Lou Hoover, people write in there, Lou. I mean, Lou is a favorite, a lot of people, a friend of mine, a radio host in, in Maine, named her car Lou Hoover after, uh, named her car Lou after Lou Hoover. Um, so that makes me smile. That makes my, my heart happy to know that people now understand Lou Hoover and the greatness that was Lou Hoover that, that was uh, formerly or, or, or commonly eclipsed by the depression and, and things like that. Um, want to keep an eye on the time because I definitely want to leave time for, for question and, and, and answer. There's Lou and, and Herbert sitting in, in wicker chairs on the White House uh, lawn there. Um, just a, just a, just just some some lovely shots. There's one. It's always I love that picture of Lou. It's so great. Um, um, 
Uh, I want to talk about the, the, the Lou Henry Hoover house in, in Stanford. Another great accomplishment of Lou Hoover is that she designed two of the houses that the Hoovers would live in. We'll get to the next one in just a minute because it's another location that I could get to. And this is a magnificent house. This is currently the president's, the president of Stanford's home. But if you look, you can see all these little steps. It's kind of like an adobe, but there's archways. Um, there's, there's Native American influences. And at the uh, Hoover Institute, at Stanford University, they have some of the original drawings, some of the original plans that Lou worked with an architect, and she designed a lot of these uh, 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 um, uh, balconies and a lot of these rooftop decks and the chimney and archways and things in the house. Here it is from the back. And I was able to walk around the entire house. Uh, 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 someone from the college gave me a grand tour of the place. You can see like the steps that go up. I mean, this is, she just had an incredible mind with no formal uh, uh, training of, of an architect. She was a geologist. Uh, again, she did not take a lot of these languages that she learned in, 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 in her travels. And it's funny, the Hoovers would, they would speak for the rest of their lives together in Mandarin Chinese in, if they wanted to have private conversations and off to the side because you know, a lot of people speak Spanish, a lot of people speak the Romance languages, but if you get in a room, in a lot of rooms, you're probably the only person that speaks Mandarin Chinese, and they could throw some stuff back and forth to each other. Again, with the China and the, the jade that they were uh, mining when they were in, uh, in, in China, when, whenever Hoover President Hoover, Herbert Hoover, would go away on a trip. He'd bring uh, Lou if she didn't go with him, if she was home with the kids or in another part of uh, another part of the, the the world, or 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 back in in California for whatever reason. He would bring her a little token of each of the places. There's a beautiful uh, jade dragon that he brought her back, that he brought Lou back from one of the one of the trips to to China that he went on, and and that. That personalized them as well to me. You know, each of the locations and each of the women revealed themselves to me in different ways that personalized them. And that allows me to, to relate to them and, and, and write about them in a way that other people can relate. Uh, I think my dad's on the call here, uh, uh, the meetup tonight as well. And I remember my dad traveled a lot. He was a mechanical engineer and traveled to uh, companies all across the United States when I was young. And he would bring me the little actual metal uh, uh, silverware. I thought the the little tiny metal silverware that you would get on flights back in the day was fantastic. Or, or like a t-shirt or something like that. But I remember very clearly I had like, you know, United or Pan Am or Continental, all the different silverware from all the stuff because he, you know, kind of tuck it in there and bring it as a little gift for me, uh, which which was neat. And, and that made the Hoovers relatable because they would bring, I still do that for people with all my travels. I bring like refrigerator magnets, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Heather, my significant other gets a, a little Limoges, a little a little ceramic box from any place that I can find one when, when we uh, travel and, and uh, not, 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 to, not together. Um, so, you know, seeing these people as human lets you look at them and judge them a little bit differently or not judge them at all. Uh, especially when it comes to the women, because they're 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 not as as political and and in that arena, that elected or that paid arena that they are in. But Stanford uh, Stanford showed me a lot. It showed me the Lou Hoover diploma. I got to see where the Hoovers met, where the Hoovers would build this grand house with the wealth that they had accumulated uh, running all over the world and call uh, 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 this home base and call California with all of their travels. Um, uh, you can see inside, you know, just the grand features of this that Lou had a hand in, again, with, with no formal training, no architecture degree, um, uh, just, again, a remarkably intelligent and, 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 and naturally capable um, 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 woman, which I just think is, is absolutely fantastic. And to see where they met, where they got this education, and she became the first woman with a, with a geology degree. Um, this is their this is their home in in Shenandoah Valley, their vacation home, their summer White House, if you will, uh, before Camp David was built uh, by the Eisenhowers um, and where presidents would go and retreat or before they had their own ranches to go back to or vacation in Martha's Vineyard or Hawaii or, or Mar-a-Lago or all the place, different places where presidents uh, now seem to run off to in vacation. The Hoovers purchased a large chunk of land for, my gosh, like almost no money, where these two rivers came together. Hoover was a big fly fisherman, and he needed a place, as most presidents do. Theodore Roosevelt had a neat little cabin in Keene, Virginia, called Pine Knot. And these 
earlier presidents would typically keep a place that was pretty close because transportation was not as not as accessible or as advanced as it is now. So they didn't want to go too far. But along what is now Skyline Drive, the Hoovers stood there and overlooked this beautiful valley. And Hoover said it was as pretty as any place he'd been in the world. And they had been around the world. And these two, these two uh, uh, streams came together and Hoover could fly fish. And once again, Lou stepped up and designed this house with open windows that would move almost as like, like uh, wings to let, the, to let the breeze in from the cross breeze from this valley. When they first went through, there was no way to get to this land. No road uh, was punched through and they went on horseback. And um, the Hoovers bought this with their own money again. And they were like, well, you know, you're a president. You can allot some money. But the Great Depression was going as there's not extra money. I have this money. I'm not taking any salary. We'll pay for it. And I think it was only a few thousand dollars to buy a couple thousand acres in this valley. And now it's a, 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 a national park. And you can go down there and you can walk in and see this. Um, that's Lou's front room, uh, completely redesigned from letters that Lou would write, and she would sit at that desk and look out at the two rivers and watch her husband fish, and there's a little bridge, um, and she wrote very fondly about the different things that she decorated in the house and what she kept on her desk and wrote letters, had, had representatives of the Girl Scouts there. She designed two different fireplaces in camp because she always wanted to keep the smell of fire around. She loved that naturally burning and would have lots of friends out and people from the Girl Scout to have retreats and things like that and sit around by campfire. And, uh, and they, they wrote letters and sang songs and fished and, and did, did what it is you do out at camp. Um, there's a fantastic story as, as a geologist, Lou went around and collected all of these rocks. She collected rocks from the area and made pathways. If I go back to the, um, you can start to see it right there at the bottom of the screen off of the steps, you can see these rocks and the pathways that would go all around camp and would lead to the different fireplaces, the stone fireplaces, the chimneys for them and the campfires that were built with all rocks from around the area that she went out and collected herself. Well, she had gone back to the White House um, uh, when they did finally build a road, backtracking a little bit, the Hoovers were about to pay for that themselves too. I think someone from the from the De Department of Defense finally uh, got them to agree to let the uh, Army Corps of Marines uh, build the road because they said the Marines need training, the Marines need to know how to do this. The Marines are are on our on our dime, on our time, on our paycheck. Let's let's get them out there and let them do some stuff. So so they did punch the road through and get them access to their Rapidan camp in the Shenandoah Valley. But while the Hoovers were back at the White House at one point, the Marines thought it would be a great idea as they were sitting around camp to paint all the rocks so they could see the pathways better. I guess they didn't know that Lou had collected the rocks themselves, wanted the natural beauty of the surroundings of the Shenandoah Valley and the creeks and the rocks and that they were geologists and all this other stuff. Word didn't make it to this team of Marines that were out there and they painted all the rocks white. Lou came back the next weekend or whenever they were coming back out there to, to relax and sit around and saw all of her rocks and all of her pathways painted. She called one of the officers and said, thank you so much. I, I, I understand the, the effort here. I understand the gesture, but we're going to need to get rid of all these painted rocks. We're all going to need to go out and collect more rocks because that's the point of it, to have it be a natural wonder. And um, I, I always get a kick out of that story there uh, in looking at this beautiful cabin that, I mean, I'd stay there now any, any given time. It's absolutely wonderful. And we can see the Hoovers there. They are a big, huge deck. I think the deck that overlooked all the rhododendron and the big tall evergreens and everything uh, by the rivers, by the by the two streams there. I think the deck was bigger than the house, uh, to be honest with you. And there the Hoovers are. There's that beautiful um, uh, 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 bridge that goes across one of the creeks where Hoover would sit and um, and stand fish you know, where he would relax and try and clear his mind and try and figure out what was one of, if not the the greatest economic downturns in in our country's history. I want to go back here and look at this picture and tell you one of the most remarkable stories about Lou Hoover specifically. They were celebrating the president's birthday at Rapidan Camp and their two sons, they had two sons, Alan and Herbert Jr. were there uh, celebrating the president's birthday and they were having dinner out on the deck. Well, a, a boy wandered into camp from the local Appalachian mountains there that, that formed the Shenandoah Valley and walked in and he was holding a cage, 
and in the cage was an opossum. And the boy gave it to the president and first lady and explained that in these parts, this is what we do for people on their birthday. We give them a meal. And I can just imagine that angry opossum sitting in his cage with the pointy teeth and the rat tail and the beady eyes just hissing and having a fit in that cage. The two Hoover boys were probably thinking, there's no way I'm eating that thing. How are we even going to cook it? And I think the president explained something to the fact that they had already cooked dinner that night, that the boy had arrived too late. Um, and they, they, they said that they would have it the next evening or prepare it some other time. I'm sure Secret Service took the uh, took the possum and out to the side and let it go in the in the woods and, and shoot it off they never they never ate the the animal but 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 uh, graciously accepted it Lou was more interested in where the boy lived and not only where the boy lived where he went to school and she asked she said where do, where do you live oh I live over the mountain some way with my brothers and sisters and family and she said well where do you go to school he said we don't have a school she said okay well you're homeschooled then mm -hmm. I guess, sure. She said, well, do you read? You know, who, who teaches you to read? And he said, well, I can't read. Who teaches you to write? Well, I don't write very well. And, and, and I, uh, you know, you can't, I can't, can't spell his name and, and things like that. And math was completely out of the, the question for the boy. And so the Hoovers did what the Hoovers always did. They used their own privilege, their own finances, their own wealth and station in life. And they built a school it's called the President's School. Then they paid for the salaries of the teacher and they brought all the kids from the area and they gave these children an education. They paid for the construction of the school, the physical building. They paid for the books. They paid for the teacher's salaries. I'm sure it weren't huge classes and it wasn't a great number of people that they put together, but this is what they did. Later in life, Lou Hoover was living in New York. They had an apartment in the, in the Waldorf, Astoria. And uh, she had a desk in her office. And after Lou passed away, they were going through some of her belongings and looking through her desk and they found a box. And in that box was a stack of checks. They were written to Lou Hoover, but they were not cashed. And that stack of checks was from a handful of students from the president's school in Shenandoah Valley, they were attempting to pay Lou Hoover back for paying for their college education. The ones with the aptitude, the ability, and the desire to go on to get a college education, but in no way could afford it. Lou Hoover paid for their college education. Some of them tried to pay back. I don't know the amounts or things like that. It's just the gesture. And Lou took the checks and probably said thank you and just never cashed them and kept them as souvenirs. I think that punctuates the points that I'm trying to make about just the good nature of these two human beings and what they wanted to do for the world around them. While they wanted to be successful, they had these adventures. They went around the world numerous times, created this wealth, uh, got, got put in, in the right place at the wrong time, but never stopped helping people, never stopped embracing technology, never stopped learning uh, the languages, the, the architecture, the everything that would go in that would prove that, that Lou Hoover is quite possibly one of the most unusual for her time that I met in all of my travels. Um, just a remarkably, incredibly loving and caring individual that I got to know through her letters. She was an independent girl. She was an independent girl that did meet her equal, that did clash to a certain point, that did go on to conquer that world together and make her mark on the world and the modern world, but only to be swept under the, under the historical blanket, under the historical carpets of the Great Depression. Again, significant and a huge factor, but not one that should erase their accomplishments and what they did. Um, I think I want to leave it there. You know, it's just such a great story of, of giving back and what they do. And I want to take some questions. I see the chat is going. Uh, there's obviously, there's so much more from a, all of these three locations to go to in the book. If it, if it made sense, I'd, I'd read the whole chapter to you here tonight. <laughs> That's not why you're tuning in. You want to hear a little bit different perspective. But Robert, do we, do we have some questions and things? Oh, yeah, we, we sure do. Yeah, you should do an audio version of your book. People can listen I, to it while they're it's, 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 it's in the work. The, the problem with an audio book is, and, and it's fun, I got to actually go back and sort of refresh a little bit of my memory and read the Lou Hoover chapter tonight before speaking to you. 
um, uh, to you all. But um, uh, to, to I want to voice my own book. That's just the, the person that I am. I think I should. Um, it's my words. It's, it's my expression. And, and, and I know the material better than anyone else because I, I lived it. I walked the miles. But that means I actually have to have the time and the facility to sit down and read two volumes to make that audio book. But we'll make it happen at some point, hopefully sooner than later. Anyway, your questions, please. Oh, yeah. I was just um, I th what it the, the who you kind of touched on it, the Hoover's real love story. I visited West Branch, the museum, about a couple years ago, and I was I'd only budgeted an hour to stop there because I was on a work trip and I had a bunch of other stuff I had to do. But um, I ended up staying there for I think like three hours or three hours and fifty. I just I, I knew a little bit about them, but not a lot. But it was just really and I, you know if I wasn't for work, I could have stayed a lot longer. I had a meeting I had to call into, but um yeah, I was really impressed with that site, with learning about the two of them. They just seemed like really fascinating uh, people that you'd want to talk to and ask them questions about their and the resources they have there, the letters between them and the journals that go back. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's journal entries for miles, and it just you know I just bring up that one from 1890 because it's so significant to the woman that she would become and the woman that she was raised to be in a time when women weren't typically raised like that, you know, so in any event. Yeah, so just, to, and then they have his um, boyhood home. It's interesting to see how, I always like visiting historic homes because not only do you learn about the person that the home is focused on, but just how people lived at that point in time. Yeah, so that tiny, was, um, it's tiny, it's tiny. Yeah, really tiny. Literally, it's like, um, it's like maybe twice the size of my shed and my shed's not very big. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just like two rooms, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. um, very small. And then she actually died of a heart attack, if I'm not mistaken, um, in their in, apartment in, in New York. And I think in, the story was he went to kiss her. Yeah, seven. I think he went to kiss her goodnight um, and came in and realized she had had a heart attack. And the, But he would end up living for 20 more years, but was really heartbroken and devastated. Very much so. Yeah, no, no, very okay. true. What about, um, so yeah, there were a few questions that came in. Um, someone asked, what about children? Did the did the Hoovers have children? Yeah, they did. They had two. They had two sons, Alan and Herbert Jr. Uh, um, and, and there's there's grandchildren and great grandchildren that run, run the Hoover Institute um, uh, in in at Stanford. Um, but the one of the one of the wonderful stories they would bring these children, these two sons, with them on their uh, on their on their adventures. And here's another thing I, I failed to mention: Lou invented a rocking bassinet. Uh, she she constructed this herself. It's 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 part metal and part string and part rope kind of thing. And it was for the steamer ships that they would go on across the ocean, so it wouldn't tip over in the in the bad seas. I, I mean, there literally there was nothing that this woman could not do. You know, she she I'm sure she had the the kid, one of the kids, or both the kids, you know, in a bassinet, and they went on one trip, and one almost over tipped tipped over or something happened in rough seas, and she said, "Well, I've got to create a, a more of a rocking." swinging, swaying uh, uh, crib or, or carriage bassinet for, for these child children to keep them safe because we're not going to stop our, our travels. Uh, just, just, just an incredible, incredibly accomplished woman. Okay. And then Angela asked, was she active in the women's suffrage movement at all? I know that was, that was before she was the first... Um... Lazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I she she not that I saw, not 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 hugely, not instrumentally. I'm sure she had strong opinions about it. I didn't see any writings, but you know, you've got to think at that point in time, she's in foreign countries and doing so oh, much travel outside of the United States that a lot of her time was spent with her husband building this this wealth and doing these travels. Oh, okay. And then let's see, Mercy joining us on Facebook asks, has being a first lady historically been considered a position of honor and respect, and has it changed over the years and decades? Oh my gosh! Well, well, yes. I mean, it, it is a position of honor and respect. I but think. but has it always been that way? Um, it it, it had very much so. Very much. Okay, so. good. You know, one of the, one of the first problems we had as a country was what to call these people. Um, the, the term first lady did not come out. It was first used. The term first lady was first used with Harriet Lane, who was uh, President Buchanan's niece, President Buchanan, the only bachelor president not to marry. There's only two bachelor presidents that have been elected, uh, James Buchanan, the uh, 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 15th president of the United States, and Grover Cleveland. I forget what number. Grover Cleveland was something like 21 and 23. He had two non-consecutive terms, but Grover Cleveland got married while he was in the White House to Francis 
Mrs. Cleveland, the youngest first lady, 21 years old when she married Grover at, at 49, a completely different story for a different meetup. Uh, interesting nonetheless. But um, uh, uh, Harriet Lane was the first woman to be referred to as first lady, but she was not the wife of a president. So the first first lady who was the wife of the president to be called first lady was actually Lucy Hayes. But going back to the Washington days, highly respected. I mean, this was the woman married to the man who led the revolution that became uh, you know this this new country and and all, all first ladies that that would follow uh, highly revered um uh and and she, mrs washington was referred to as lady washington so always as a term of respect um um you know i th i think i think a lot of uh a, a, a lot of our our well, I, I don't want to get too much into, into modern time or, or politics at all, but I think a lot of that respect uh, has is is leaving us, and I and I hope to see I hope to see it come 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 back. That would be nice. Um, let's see. Robin asked a question just more about first ladies in general. Was there a particular first lady that was considered the funniest or had the best sense of humor? Oh, they, you know that's a that's a good question. <laughs> and it, it, when I I mean there 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 were first ladies that were they were always very good natured and good entertainers, especially good entertainers. And and humor came into that. The ones that come to mind, Dolly Madison, is the grand entertainer. No one no one threw parties like Dolly Madison, and. Um, uh, the rum punches and the the late hours and the just the the dancing and the and the good times. Um, but Mamie Eisenhower was an incredible entertainer and apparently a, a perfect hostess that, that that started in the the military career. Eisen Eisenhower's military career, entertaining um, the the wives and families and and other uh, officers and things like that. Um, um, Grace Coolidge was a very, very funny individual with a great nature, which is funny because she sort of, and this is similar to Dolly Madison, sort of contrasted their gruff, all business uh, husbands. Uh, so it was sort of a yin and yang, opposites attract kind of thing. Grace Coolidge, you always see her smiling and you see Silent Cal always <laughs> almost frowning in the pictures. And she's Grace Coolidge, also known as the first lady of baseball, loved baseball. She was the scorekeeper for her college team and always loved going out to Washington Senators games in Washington, D.C. But her all time favorite being from Vermont was the Boston Red Sox, the closest uh, baseball team to that. But in modern times, I think one of the ladies, first ladies with the best sense of humor was Nancy Reagan. Um, Nancy Reagan could poke fun at herself. Um, <laughs> she she went to a she went to a very famous gridiron uh, 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 dinner in Washington D.C. and everyone gave uh, not everyone a, a lot of people would give Nancy Reagan grief for being from Hollywood and being too fancy. She would say that she was trying to bring an elegance back to the White House that was known in the Kennedy White House and and reestablish that. I think the Carters had more of a down home feel. Each president and first lady bring their own personalities to this. And I think that that was a fun thing for a lot of people. But when Nancy Reagan came in from Hollywood and brought her Hollywood friends and things like that, wanted a little bit of more of a, of a, of a Kennedy-esque elegance and had the gowns and everything. So she went and almost to the she, to, to the emperor's new clothes, she came in all uh, um, uh, mismatched, almost dressed like a clown. Uh, there's a picture if you if you if you if you uh, if you Google Nancy Reagan, uh, uh, emperor's new clothes, not emperor's new clothes. What is the what is the poem that I'm thinking of? Um, but but she she almost put together a limerick that she would talk about um, m m this this outfit that she wore and she was wearing rain boots and a flowered shirt with striped pants and bright colors and without the makeup she she didn't have clown makeup but she was essentially dressed like a clown to make fun of herself at this at this affair where she would typically be in a Hollywood style almost uh, Academy Award style gown but she could poke fun at herself and the whole just say no campaign you know, there's pictures of Charles Barkley holding Nancy Reagan up to slam dunk a just say no basketball at a, I think it was an Indiana Pacers uh, 76ers game during her just say no campaign she would sit on Mr. T's lap who was dressed up like uh, like Santa Claus around Christmas time uh, to to promote giving giving kids uh, 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 kids in need gifts and and toys for tots type of, of thing and um, uh, would go on different strokes the the TV show to promote the just say no her, her campaign and, and use a bit of that celebrity or that Hollywood power that she had to promote that campaign. Uh, always with a little with a little wink and a nod to to show that she wasn't, I think, taking herself too too terribly seriously, which I I think is an important trait and quality. 
we're going to be celebrating her 100th birthday later this year because Nancy Reagan was born on July 6, 1921. So we'll have to do something special um, in July. I always thought that Lady Bird Johnson and um, Barbara Bush um, kind of like to joke around and you know were very easygoing in that regard. Didn't take Barbara Bush, you know, I'll tell you, Barbara, I can't even believe this question was asked to her in one of her 60 Minutes interviews, and 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 I forget who gave the interview, but she said. She, uh, the the interviewer asked her. They said, "You know, what do you say to your critics that say that you're that you're a um, um, that you're an older lady and you and you and you don't dress very well?" Or, or you know, they, it was some kind of criticism. And she said, "She said, oh no, I, I dress just fine. I'm just not a very attractive person, or something along those lines." Where she had, she just, she just she, th that kind of stuff just rolled off her back. I, I will say this about Barbara Bush: for all the people that I know. Or, or, or she said that she's a she's a fine she's a critics that 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 criticized her appearance and she said no no I'm a fine I'm a fine looking woman I just dress very poorly I think that's what it was oh, something along those lines um, but of all the people who have worked in all the different administrations and this is fantastic that, that I got to meet all these people and talk to these different people that were secret service agents or pilots of Marine One or Air Force One or Air Force Two uh, pastry chefs butlers stewards. Uh, people that were that worked for the house, that worked for the White House, that worked for the structure, for the executive mansion, that worked in multiple administrations. They would work, uh, you know, anywhere from like Carter up through Reagan or or Kennedy through whatever. I, I met I met a lovely woman uh, in her 90s who still lives in Virginia wrote a book about Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, she was Jacqueline Kennedy's uh, uh, executive secretary. She used to work for JFK. She was right out of high school. Mary, um, Mary Gallagher is her name, I, I believe. And, and uh, 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 she worked for the Kennedy office in Boston right out of high school when he was a senator. And JFK loved her work and, and what she did so much that he brought her to Washington with her and said, I want you to run my wife's office as first lady, which she did. And Jackie would go over to her, her house with the Secret Service, very clandestine operations, and sneak her in, and they'd have spaghetti dinner, and Jackie would help her kids with their homework, and their kids were friends, and all it's just fantastic stories, um, and a wonderful book that I can't recommend more highly. But these Secret Service agents, these pastry chefs, these people that work for every administration, nine times out of ten, they say... The absolute nicest, and you take politics completely out of the story, as I always love to do. They said the nicest couple ever to live in the White House, George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush. They remembered people's names, people's families' names, where their kids went to school, their pets' names, anniversaries, very generous with gifts uh, and, and private parties for the staff and their family. Um, just said that just two, two of the most wonderful human beings that would, would continue in a, in a very, very uh, productive post-White House career philanthropic endeavor for Barbara Bush. Barbara Bush has her name um, on, on more schools, hospitals, and, uh, and buildings than, than, than any other first lady in history. Okay. And then what about, what did, um, what kind of was Lou Hoover involved in stuff after she left the White House? Did anything um, noteworthy? It was just more of a kind of a retirement and take it easy. It, it, it was of? more. It was more of a retirement thing as they did move to New York, and she didn't live too terribly long. I'd have to do the as you mentioned. Hoover lived she twenty in the forties, early forties. Yeah. Okay. So she it did wasn't have too long time. after. She did it. She did have a. She did. She did stay in touch with the Girl Scouts, and like I say, she was the first first lady to be an honorary Girl Scout and keep that. So I know that she stayed in touch with them and active with those types of things. Um, uh, uh, but 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 then did 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 retire a, a bit and and, and live a, a, a more quiet life in in New York. Okay, no problem. Um, let's see. Someone asked, "Were you referring to something called the clothes have no emperor?" Instead of the emperor has no clothes. Oh yeah, well the emperor has. I you know that's a that's a that's a play and a and a and a and a and a book. I remember seeing that play as a as a kid at a local uh, playhouse and and kind of a kind of a joking uh, thing where the emperor was getting new clothes. I forget if if, if I, I can't I could Google on my phone, but it, it's something. My, okay. my my friend Sanford Gruenfeld always brings up the Nancy Reagan thing. He remembers the guy I went to high school with remembers it very vividly. And it's just, she put together sort of a poem or a limerick or a rhyme about her, her clothes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that she was dressed a bit clownish and things. 
And I, I always, it, it always goes into my mind as the emperor's new clothes, but it, it, it's something completely, completely different there. I'm, okay, I'm, no problem. And then let's see, Sandra asked, why do you think Lou Hoover is not more well-known given that she's so fascinating? I would think yeah, no, no, no. It, era that she it, was in the first lady role was a lot different back then than it is now. It, it was, I, I don't think, I don't, well, no, number one, I think the Hoovers would be served much better from, from the 24 hour news cycle now and the internet and how much we know because we oh, right. would be able to research things or we would actively right. look at the good things that they were doing while the other stuff was kind of falling apart. But again, you know, um, uh, Lou was also a, ahead of her time in the civil rights movement. Lou Hoover invited the first African-American woman to tea, to a first lady's tea. I have it written down here so I get it right. It's Jessie DePriest. And she was the wife of an Illinois congressman, African-American Illinois congressman uh, named Oscar DePriest. And she was invited to uh, a White House tea with other wives of other lawmakers in 1929. And Lou caught a lot of grief for it. People didn't like it. People didn't think that that happened. But Lou thought otherwise and would bring that in. So, you know, again, I think, you know, we know more about Watergate and the Nixon White House than we knew about than we know about Pat Nixon. And I think when these massive um, uh, 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 happenings and occurrences and things that, that rock the United States and rock the world as the Great Depression did or Watergate or, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, 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 retiring president is retiring as, as Nixon did, stepping down. Um, they just overshadow these things. And there were not the massive PR machines and social media and, and, and agencies that were, that were hired to, to protect these legacies and, 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 and damage control and all the stuff that we do and, 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 and get ahead of these type of crises and things today. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe Hoover would have been able to get another term and do a spin on it like they do in Washington now and would have been able to do more. I, I don't know. You know, that, that's pure speculation. But that, that's why we don't know about her. They would have they would have pulled up her previous um, Twitter and Instagram posts yeah. when she was in Asia. If she was right, like, right, no. right. Or been like, hey, what about the school? What about all the good things I did? You know, you would have been, you would have had that damage control machine out there churning and burning all the all the all the things. They would have had her, you know, making speeches and all these other things. Mm. But um, yeah. someone asked where um, the museum is. So this is just a quick map. It's in Iowa. So West West Branch, Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, Hoover's birthplace. Yeah, yeah. So if you get a chance to check it out, maybe when um, COVID ends, we can plan a um, group field trip there. It's actually not too, too far from like Chicago and Springfield, Illinois, and um, the Truman Library. And yep. Independence there's so Missouri. many. In, I tell you, in the Hoover, in the Hoover chapter, you'll see, again, I'm not a traditional historian. This isn't what I set out to do. These first ladies revealed themselves to me to be so remarkable. I, 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 felt that I had to. Um, those are such great pictures there. Yeah, there she is. Young, with the young boys. These were just um, some pictures I had from, from some other presents. But I, I, I get to tell stories of what it's like to, to, to be a producer and make a television series and what it's like to travel on your own with, with seven bags of gear and what it's like to eat <laughs> in, you know, where to go to eat in West I And I got, I got stuck. There was a thunderstorm when I was trying to fly. I was going from West Branch, Iowa, to uh, Stanford University, the next day I had a, an appointment that I had to get to the house because that the 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 Lou Hoover Henry Hoover house in Stanford. I mean, someone lives there. You can't just go traipsing through there. And the pilot stepped off the plane. They were coming from Denver. I had a connection through Denver down to Stanford where I would make this early. I was basically taking the red eye in. Then I would have to rent a car out of San Francisco airport, get to my hotel, all the other stuff. And the pilot stepped. I've never seen this before in my life. The pilot walked off the plane. As they got there, hours and hours late, they'd come through a lightning storm. He grabbed the microphone and he said, I am violating TSA laws for how long I've been flying in the air, and this plane will not turn around and go back to Denver tonight. And he slammed the phone down, and everyone just kind of looked down and went, uh, and then ran for the for the ticket booth to, to respond and get the other things. And I had to start calling my contacts in California in a different time zone and get to a hotel to sleep for about an hour until I take a shuttle back for the thing in the morning, race to my appointment, get to Stanford University, get to the home. I, it was just, it, I mean, now it's exciting to think about, but boy, it was stressful at the time. <laughs> and then um, just for, we were, I posted in the chat, but here is one of Andrew's two books. There's two volumes and quite a few people in the comments were posting that they um, 
bought it and they've read it and they really liked it a lot. Oh, so you get a lot of great feedback from that. So very kind, much. very. And kind. then um, again, just as I mentioned before, if you joined us late, so this is the fourth um, presentation Andrew has been kind enough to give to our group. The first one was just kind of an overview of the first lady's role in general. Um, and the second one, he talked about Abigail Adams. Uh, the third one, he talked about Lucy Hayes. And then of course, tonight, Lou Hoover. So these are on our YouTube page, if you missed them. And then I'll also send out the link um, along with the link to Andrew's book, if you want to um, check those out. And so you can actually autograph the books, though, if someone orders them through uh, oh, your website. That's a neat sure, touch. Sure. You don't, they don't do that through Amazon. <laughs> no, they don't. And I should mention this. I'm very proud of the fact my, my publisher is Tactical 16, and they are an independent veterans group. And part of the profits of these books, when you order directly through me, go to the publisher and to veterans and help veterans write and publish their own books. And we've found that this helps with uh, PTS quite a bit where these, mm -hmm. these authors are unedited and, and, and free to tell whatever story they want of their experience in, in, in combat, their experience in the military, their experience uh, trying to work themselves back into uh, everyday civilian life, or just tell, tell stories or write poetry or children's books, whatever they want to do, when you can express yourself in this way. So it's, it's added bonus, you know, you're, you're, you're helping out a really good uh, group of, of people that are uh, uh, largely responsible for our freedoms and, and all of the life that we enjoy here in America, and let them tell their stories and write their books. But then you also, I get to, to, to sign the book as well. I should also say that on firstladiesman.com, again, you can watch the entire C-SPAN series. You get my interviews, my articles, uh, podcasts, all kind of stuff. Connect with me on social media. I got everything. I got Twitter. I got Facebook. I got Instagram. <laughs> you get the daily facts. You're a full you service ask, supplier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can ask <laughs> questions. You can email me, firstladiesman at gmail.com. If your question didn't get answered here, or you order the book, you read it, you've got more questions. I, 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 I love the interaction. It makes this adventure just so rewarding for me. And it just, it just gets the story of these women out there uh, so much more to, to know that this leadership has always been there. This influence has always been there. And they are not just indirectly, they are directly responsible for the formation, the success, and the continuing uh, development of, of these United States. Okay, awesome. Well, with that, why don't we wrap things up? So again, Andrew, thanks so much for, um, I didn't get a chance to catch up with you to see if you wanted to do um, a presentation next month, but I'll send you an email when you mentioned no, the, no, the Wilsons would be fascinating because um, the Wilsons have a mid-Atlantic connection um, that not a lot of people are aware of. But I'll send you an email afterwards and we'll get that. We'll get the logistics on that squared away. So Getting thanks everyone for joining us. Time. Happy Friday. Um, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your night and your weekend. And we hope we'll see you all in person someday in the near future. Robert, thank you so much. And everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for spending some of it with me. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Bye.